Hey, it's Sylvan, and this is the Handpin Podcast. This episode of the podcast is part two of a conversation I had with Colin Folk. He makes an instrument called the Ether, and we got to sit down and talk story for an hour at his shop in Northern California. Part one is about Colin's beginning story, how he was classically trained on the cello, but slowly grew weary of jumping through the hoops of institutionalized Western music. In that previous episode, you get to relive the day Colin discovered the handpin, and you start to see how he developed a passion that would eventually lead him to pick up the hammer himself. So if you haven't listened to part one yet, hit pause and go back one episode, and it will all make sense. Quick refresher as to where we left off last time. After over a year of bootstrapping his way into making handpans, Colin had now achieved a level of consistency that had put him on the map as a handpan maker. It was clearly working. Now he just needed to go get a real shop, real tools to build upon that foundation. That's where we pick up today with part two. Here we go. Okay, so you got some tools, um, but you have the mind of a problem solver and you solved a major problem. Let's talk about hydroforming for a sec. Yeah, uh, hydroforming and uh, is kind of a big umbrella term for an industrial process of forming metal. Um, there's a few versions of it. Um, sometimes the, the version that I adopted for our industry, I would put it more under like fluid forming, but that's just a technicality. It's the big umbrella is hydroforming. Mm -hmm. um, the main idea with ours is that there's no pressurized bladder involved to form the metal. We're going liquid right on the part steel. Um, so essentially it's two big steel plates. Um, one that is just a big plate that a hose goes into, and the other plate has a big ring cut out of it, just a big circle. Mm -hmm. And you sandwich a piece of metal, whatever you want to use to make a hand pan. Uh, most of us use just a low carbon steel. Um, you sandwich that between the two plates, bolt it all together, and then pump in pressurized water. Mm -hmm. And so what happens is the incoming water pressure begins to be stronger than the tensile strength of the material, and so it just blows up a bubble and it pushes the metal that you want to form through that ring and because uh, of the physical properties of water pressure um, it's even across the surface so it just blows up this essentially perfect hemisphere yeah um, it, and the significance of it is that it bypasses a, a process which is either extremely physically demanding or very expensive to acquire some big tools mm -hmm. physically demanding if you were to hand hammer a, a hand pan shell it would take hours yep and uh, most of us untrained to that type of work could probably not do it in one sitting because your your arms would hurt too yeah, much. Yeah, yeah. There's a lot to be said for hand hammering in that um, a lot of people find that those slight imperfections super desirable. Mm -hmm. um, I made 50 instruments by hand syncing with air hammers um, and those imperfections you can accommodate those in the back end of production in terms of tuning and tuning around it. Right. Um, yeah, I remember my the first shell I tried to sink by hand. It took me two days, oh. um, and then I ruined it. <laughs> that was like the very first thing I ever tried. Two days, and I ruined it. Um, and now, if I do it by hand, I can do it in about two hours. This is like a, just with a mallet, um, which yeah, I, I, I visited recently, which we'll talk about. Um, so, so hydroforming. I was introduced in a, an interesting way in that I had someone that came and visited here, mm -hmm. and they showed me this video of this process. Mm -hmm. And my immediate thought was, why are we not using this in our industry? Because yeah. from what I saw in that video, it, it seemed fairly achievable. Um, it technically didn't seem super complicated. Um, it, w it was far beyond my comfort zone in terms of my current abilities at the time. Mm -hmm. But so, so this person, his name is Pascal and he was from Greece. And a after he left, we kept this conversation going. Um, I have this rule in my workshop is that if you have an idea, it's my job to try to poke holes in it. Mm -hmm. Meaning that it, not to say it's a bad idea, but let's just like test the test idea. It. Let's hold, let's, let's just try to figure out a reason that we should not do it. Yeah. And so Pascal, who is an engineer is very much in this mindset. So we just emailed back and forth for a month really debating 
why we sh why I shouldn't do this. Mm -hmm. And we got to the point where we mm -hmm. we, did, we did, didn't come up with a reason why we shouldn't um, from a theoretical standpoint. But theoretical is very different than the actual, you know, the nuts and bolts of it. The like, just how much is it going to cost? How thick do the plates have to be? Yeah. Um, you know, and silly things too. Like, can I get one of those plates in through my door in the workshop? Like, what does that look like? Um, right. So we got to the point where, like, I couldn't not do it. The potential outcome, if it worked, was going to be so big, it was going to be worth the front end risks. Mm. So the front end risks were that it was going to be a lot of money mm -hmm. um, just to order the plates. It was going to be, you know, in the thousands. Um, there was the risk too of like, I'm out of my depth technically that I don't know what I'm doing, which was very true. Um, it doesn't mean that I couldn't learn, but that was really worrisome. Mm -hmm. um, so I think, <clears throat> yeah, fast forward again, I was back at an event in North Carolina. Um, and the, yeah, that must've been 2015. Um, and I, like I was at the event and I received an email from the company who was gonna water jet these big plates for me. Like, this is the final design, is this good? And I sent that email like, yes, let's do it. And then like, had a panic attack uh, because it was just like, okay, this is it. It's now or never. And I just said, let's do this. So that was uh, probably around early July. By the t by around like August, I think I had everything that I needed. Uh, hoses, uh, pressure washer, mm -hmm. stupid connectors that took too long to find. Um, and then it was, okay, let's see if we can get this thing to work. And the, the issue that I had initially was keeping the pressure in. Mm -hmm. um, s finding a way to seal that whole sandwich of metal and not have water leaking. I spent days mopping my f shop because water would just go everywhere. And then on a whim, I had one last idea. I had kind of run through all my ideas of how to keep the pressure in, gaskets and things like that. And I had one last idea. And so I had set it up the night before and then it was gonna be ready the next morning. And I came in and attempted it and it worked. It was really pretty, pretty big career highlight. Uh, th there was a bunch of things that happened. Um, I had no sense of how long it took. Like I, I because it, I, you know, I didn't know how much pressure I was going to need to generate. There mm -hmm. were still some unknowns, mm -hmm. so I, I was hiding behind some barrels that I had stacked up in my shop. I had like a blast shield on, and I was like peeking around it looking at uh, the shell that was forming and I had set up like a little crossbar above the shell so that was kind of my desired height for a shell. Mm -hmm. So the goal was to get the shell to form up and hit this crossbar. If it hit it then I would just turn it down because mm -hmm. I had a, a switch. Um, and I, I don't, I like I watched it and I, I remember it cleared the plate and that was already significant of like, oh I haven't even gotten there yet. But uh, that's an inch and a half. I wanted to go to like four and a half inches or so. Um, yeah, and that's that's like the point where like adrenaline spike, heartbeat in my ears, uh, full tunnel vision, wow. zero sense of how long it took. Like it finished, and I was like, I don't know if that was thirty seconds or five minutes. Like I I really lost sense of time, and I I was you know so thrilled. And and I, my workshop is here in a courtyard, and there's a bunch of other kind of creative artists and craftsmen that are in the area. And I ran out to tell somebody, and nobody was here. Oh, and like, no. and then so I, I knew my wife was at work, and I couldn't call her. And so I'd call my dad, and he didn't pick up. And so I just had oh. this like very giant career moment, and I just kind of fist pumped in the air, and and then went back in. <laughs> that was a really exciting part, but that was like a, a mere. It was, it, was a, it was a small victory in this. Yeah. It was going to be this much bigger battle to to figure out. Um, I guess I'd answered the the first scary question, which was, can I even get this to work? I'm like, yay, I did. Right. But the much bigger question was, will this work? Will this application work for our industry? Yeah. Can I take this now very perfect form and turn it into an instrument? Um, right. All things pointed towards yes, but yeah. I was not at all sad. I was not going to all be satisfied or relieved until I had finished the instrument. So, th so then the, the time frame on that extends way out because I have to not only do one shell, I, I want to do a batch of shells, so that takes a long time, and then the whole processing of that. So that was in early August, and it wasn't until maybe late September that I had a, like a finished, completed instrument, and it was a, yeah, a big thumbs up of like, yes, yeah. in fact, not only does it work, it seems to work really, really well. Mm -hmm. um, so that was, that was like a champagne moment <laughs> for, for me. I bet. And that like, okay, this is this is big. It worked. I got it to work. This is feasible. It works for my application. Um, and then even beyond that, there were still a f quite a few months of 
wrinkles to iron out within the process and how to keep pressure in consistently and mm -hmm. tools and plumbing. There was a bunch of plumbing. I redid the plumbing a ton of times mm -hmm. to kind of dial it in and, and then just understanding the parameters, how much pressure, how long does it take, what's mm -hmm. safe, what doesn't feel safe. Um, so there was, it was great to have that finished instrument, but it was still like, oh, there's still months, months of hard work ahead to kind of dial this thing in. Yeah. It's important to note that you decided to share this project as an open source project. You did not patent it. You did not monetize it. And uh, it's now being used by over 50 handpan builders worldwide. How does that feel? Oh, you know, that was, um, that felt like it was going to be a really difficult decision. There were meetings with patent attorneys. There were explorations into options for monetizing it. And it was probably over a week after we, at that point, we had one baby, we put the baby to bed, and my wife and I would just kind of openly discuss. We, we had a mental kind of decision tree that we had made, which is to share it or not to share it. And so for a week, we went down the branch of not to share it and what all that could look like. Mm -hmm. What would it look like to actually monetize it? What does that money look like? Um, what does it mean to get a patent? And so we, we spent a week kind of discussing that and then it really came to a head that she asked me two questions. She said, do you ever want to have to be in a lawyer's office dealing with this? And I said, no, I just want to be in my workshop. And then the second one was, do you ever want to have to go to court and potentially defend a patent? Um, and I said, no, again, like, I just want to be here in my shop mm -hmm. working. I'm more concerned about the art form. And so that made those decisions really easy. It was like, oh, and the answer to both of those are no. So we worked our way back up that decision tree, went down mm -hmm. the other branch, and it was like, what will this look like to share? Which that was, it was a tricky thing to share in that it, it's, it's a big process. There's yeah. a lot of moving parts in it. Um, so that decision, I had made that decision and probably it, the goal was to share it again like six months later, again, back in North Carolina. Mm -hmm. um, the, the, yeah, the following and you made a, a, a very thorough and informative video expose of the whole process. Yeah, and it was kind of a multi-pronged approach to share it. There was actual plans that were shared, um, like the physical CAD files. Um, there was a video where I walk you through how the plumbing works, how you put it together, mm -hmm. expectations around parameters, uh, please be safe warnings. And then the third part was that I did a presentation at one of the gatherings that was planned and it was filmed and then shared um, kind of a, a long-winded TED talk sort of thing, if you will. Right. Um, I had talked to that event organizer and I said, look, I, I'm not, gonna, <laughs> this is about as good as I could get my ego in check. I was like, I, I'm good with sharing this. I don't feel like I need anything in return but I wouldn't mind a round of applause. <laughs> so, but it was, it was, you know, I think part of it too is like that first six months of me working and really that first year of me working, this whole thing of hydroforming was yeah. like um, top secret. We call, it was like skunk works, which is means like a very top secret project. Mm -hmm. So this was a skunk works project for me. And so, well, which meant that part of my work had become super isolating again and that I was here yeah. kind of working in private and in secret. Um, not, it was not to keep it away from people Really, it was more to figure out what do I want to do with this, right. and and then it, and also like if people are going to do this, I want them to be as safe as possible. So uh, how how to make that happen? Of course. So then yeah, so the presentation was kind of a little bit for me in that I felt I really now I was ready to share, and I was like, oh my gosh, I have had this crazy, amazing, super intense mm -hmm. year of developing this machine. I would really just I want to talk about it, yeah. and um, and and also I think I was I was hoping I was going to present it in a way that was fun and interesting to tag along. It was for me it was a good story to present too, but I also just yeah. I just needed to share it in that way too. There's a proverb that goes something like the greatest sin in the desert is to find water and not tell anyone, mm. and. Hydroforming in the handpan industry, in the handpan art form, was so well received because it alleviated one of the biggest barriers to making handpans, that, that great um, physical challenge to, to hand hammer. But the reality is forming the shells is just one step um, of the whole process. It, it's not a shortcut to making good instruments. and I. I really like uh, a couple of pieces of content, a couple of videos that I've seen on your channels recently. One is, is a series called 
So you want to make handpans? Question mark, question mark, question mark. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us about that. What's the idea behind this series? That's a, that's a good question. Um, I was and still am and have been guilty of romanticizing the idea of making these instruments. It is. It's wonderfully romantic. It's fantastic to take a piece of metal and turn it into something that is playable, that generates music and mm -hmm. gives people joy. Um, that's the romantic side of it. And that's still very real. There is just this other side of that. It's actually really hard work. Um, it technically is an incredibly challenging art form to be in. Mm -hmm. um, it's really, really hard to achieve something of high quality. Um, and, and it's 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 really, really taxing um, on a bunch of fronts. Uh, it can be, of course, physically taxing, but it can be really mentally and emotionally taxing too. You know, I, I don't have as many um, unsuccessful instruments as I do successful these days, as my skills have gotten better. but. What's, what's even so even now, what's hard is when I make something that's unsuccessful, there's no less of me in it. Mm -hmm. I still made as big and great of an attempt as I have. So the, the success is a really, really high high, but the, the, the unsuccessful, I'm avoiding the word failure, the, the unsuccessful ones still take the same amount out of you. Um, so it can be really, uh, yeah, I, I, emotionally and mentally draining in that sense. Yeah. Um, and then beyond that, there's just stuff that we in this industry have to deal with mainly in that like there's not a lot that's made for this industry so we're constantly having to come up with our own tools and fabricate or adapt things for our world and then there's just the stuff there's just it's just work there's days that are hard or stuff doesn't right. go right and and so part of me is sometimes I feel frustrated in that people don't comprehend how challenging it is to make these mm -hmm. and also I just don't get asked about my work all that much so I felt like I could share these frustrations and grievances in, and help myself process them, but do it in a way that also kind of pulls back the curtain on the romanticism of making these of like, no, actually it's, it right. can be that, but it can be really hard and it can be, you can have tough days. And, and so it's been a lot of things. Um, there's opportunities to share something every single day right. <laughs> under the, the hashtag, so you want to make handpans. Because, um, you know, it's like with all social media, it's great to see this perfect page of all successful yeah. stuff and pretty and glossed over. And it's like, oh, no, like, that's that's not exactly how, because, yeah. like, if, yeah, if you go in my other workshop, there's a pile of shells that are just ones that didn't work out. Some of those shells have 10 hours in them. Mm -hmm. Some of them have 40 hours of work into them. As a player, it makes me so much more appreciative of mm. all the work that goes into these instruments, which I never want to take for granted. Um, and um, and so I think it's it's a meaningful series, and I I love seeing those those posts. Yeah, what's been fun, and one of my goals was with it is that. Uh, I, if I'm feeling this way as someone who makes these, I'm sure I'm not the only one who's feeling this way. So the mm -hmm. goal of creating that as a hashtag was that any maker can take that and use it. The next time that they have a problem in their shop, they can just air their grievances and throw that. So that's happened. So that's been really fun. A few makers have been like, oh, I had a tough day and this thing broke. Hashtag, Good. so you want to make can fans. You've also launched recently another kind of challenge, another kind of invitation, the three hammer handpin challenge. That's right. And um, so it's an instrument that you have built using only three hammers. Mm -hmm. the, the, the shells were not hydroformed. No. Um, you did not use a press to form the dimples. Nope. You made this instrument from scratch. Yeah. Um, tell <sighs> us about that. I still debate if it was a good idea or a bad idea. It's, it's a great idea. Just the, act, the actual act of having to do it, I, f I feared it. No, so, so rewinding a couple years, uh, the original company who made this instrument, Panart, mm -hmm. they've been posting some kind of old uh, footage of them even pre-hung days. And so there was one video where the main, one of the main people, Felix, uh, was out on tour with uh, his steel pan band and just felt inspired to make something. He went and found a barrel that had just been sitting in a lot and he just made something. Mm. Had a couple of hammers, just felt inspired to create. And that was my takeaway from that video. Like, he just, it didn't matter. He just wanted to make something. And mm -hmm. he, did, he didn't do anything fancy. He just got a barrel and a hammer, just got busy by a river. Mm -hmm. And uh, for me, that was the, the, the takeaway from that was so inspiring to just leave it all behind and just be creative. Now, the, the fear with that is that it's really hard to do it that way. And so I had been inspired by this video for a long time. And I'd been kind of trying to convince myself to do it and I had not been able to. So the idea of not only challenging myself but then putting out as a challenge to everyone else 
made it seem more approachable and tangible and gave me more of a reason to do it. And then putting it under the, the umbrella of like, I'm only going to use three hammers, mm -hmm. um, which from a making standpoint becomes extremely limiting. Mm -hmm. um, mainly because the first two hammers are really obvious choices. You have to have a big hammer to sink the shell, and then you have to have a very small hammer to fine tune with. Um, in the video that I was inspired by, he made a steel pan. I was planning to make a hand pan, so the hammers needed to fit through the hole in the bottom so I could tune from the inside. So that right. was a very specific hammer. So two of the hammers are obvious choices, and then you're left with all these other jobs within the making process, and you kind of have to have this one one hammer to fit all the other jobs. So the third hammer was kind of the harder choice. So it took me a while to kind of collect the hammers. I bought my hammers from Jimmy James in France, from Jimmy's House mm -hmm. of Hammers. I bought two wood mallets from him, and then I used my standard uh, like 20 ounce ball peen tuning hammer. Now, and then it took me a while. I needed a barrel that I could sink on top of to sink these shells, to attach my rings to. And so I think it was by October 1st of this year, I had everything that I needed. Mm -hmm. And it was all here on this table that we're sitting by. And I don't think I started until October 9th because every, every morning <laughs> I walk in it. and look at it and be like, nah, screw that. I'm not doing that today. And was then, it reassuring um, to, to know after the fact that you could still do that? I was confident that I was going to be able to do it. Um, there were definitely some surprises within the actual act of doing it. I was fearing... The reason I didn't want to get started is because the first thing I had to do was sink these shells by hand. And having done that but not done it for a long time, that's the part I was fearing the most. And although it was physically strenuous, it, it ended up not being as bad as I thought. I, it was interesting. I was better at it than the last time I did it five years ago. Yeah. Because there's been this accumulation of skill sets along the way that happened to be applicable to this process. Mm -hmm. um, I was better with my left hand, so I could sink with two hands, so that made it go faster. Um, and so that, that, was, that ended up being not so bad. Um, it, it kind of turns into this physical meditation. It's like a, mm -hmm. that you kind of break through that 20 minute barrier like a runner's high and then you just kind of get in the groove. Um, there was a moment, I'm gonna spoil a little bit of the video, there was a moment where I sink my first shell and I remove the ring that was holding it to reveal that it's, I had failed <laughs> and I didn't know until I was done. And what had happened is the metal that was supposed to be pinched in the ring that would become the flange to glue on had gotten sucked in under the ring. So after two hours of extremely strenuous labor, I reveal that the shell is ruined and I'm gonna to have to do it again. Now, as the person who had just spent two hours sinking that shell, who'd been fearing it for weeks, <laughs> mildly <laughs> devastated. But then as the person on, who was behind the camera, who was also docummenting this process, <laughs> I was like mildly amused of like- That is a great That sucks great for story. the guy who just sunk that shell, but from a, like a viewer's perspective, it just got a little more interesting. The plot thickens. The plot thickens. So yeah, I came in the next day and sucked it up and, and did it again and was very cautious to not make that mistake again. And, and I say it in the video, it actually is like, uh, it's a totally rookie mistake. One I was aware of and I, one I actively tried to avoid and still mm -hmm. made. So so the, the goal of the three hammer challenge in that sense was to tap back into those rudiments, to tap back into those building blocks of what I think it is to be a good maker. I didn't, I didn't use a press to make dimples until I could make a good one by hand. I wanted mm -hmm. to be, you know, in touch with why a dimple had to be a certain shape or depth or size or proportion of why it worked. And then great, I'll get the tool that will just mm -hmm. do it every time. But I wanted the, I wanted the tool to be informed by experience. So this process was to go back and get back in touch with the, that information process of, you know, do I still understand it? Can I still do it? Um, so it, it was extremely strenuous, but it, it, it I was nervous about it because I was worried that it was going to expose weaknesses in my mm. my abilities, and it did. <laughs> but it also, what I didn't expect is it exposed strengths that I didn't realize that I had or I had accumulated over time. Mm -hmm. um, and it also it also upwelled old skills and techniques that I had forgotten about because mm -hmm. I just hadn't had to use them in a while. So for me, that was the major goal of to to show that I can do it by hand is important, but also to kind of tap back into those old skill sets mm -hmm. and really just go back to the root of why I want to do this in the beginning, which was like I just I just want to make. Yeah. And so let's go back to the the origin of that. Yeah. Um, Has anyone responded? Yeah. To so that the, that was the, the last challenge? the last part of the challenge was like uh, was okay. I have done this, so now I am sending that challenge out to every other maker in the world. I have laid a gauntlet and I'm asking you to try to walk through it. Not in a, a, a competitive way, but in a, in a, 
as someone who does this work, I feel a responsibility to the art form to both caretake and curate and guide it in a way that's that I think is best in the ways that I can do it. Mm -hmm. Hi, open sourcing hydroforming is an example of that. You know, that open sourcing statement was an opportunity for me to tell everyone, in case we've forgotten, this is what I think we are as a community, mm -hmm. open, sharing, caring, supportive. And so this, for me, still falls under that same category of this is an opportunity for us to, to really care for this art form, to make sure that we yeah. know it all the way down at the roots. Um, and the challenge was put out to people like me who've been making a long time. The challenge was put out to people who maybe are making but have never done it this mm -hmm. way. And, and the third part was, after as I started filming it, it went over maybe, I filmed it over two weeks. And so as I was going, I was editing it. And as I was editing it, I, I was reviewing it, and oftentimes with my three-year-old daughter. And she asked one day, she says, is this how you make hand pants? And I said, well, like, I said, no. And I said, well, yes. I said, well, it's, it's different than how I usually do it. And so the realization that she prompted was, oh, this is going to actually also become this expose of the most rudimentary, simplistic mm -hmm. approach to making an instrument. This is actually could be a guide. If you've never seen an instrument made, this is a one way you can do it. And all you need is you need three hammers, um, some pipes to make dimples. There's a few things. The tuning rings are things you actually have to buy um, to hold the steel. But like it's you, you really can do it in this you know, rather simplistic approach. You don't need all the tools and yeah. all the tech. Um, you can do it all by hand. It's it's hard. Right. But um, so it, the third thing that I realized with this video is it was going to be this potential kind of guide of how to uh, make a, a simple hand pan. Uh, right. It's simple only in the approach. It's still very complex to make one, but um, it doesn't involve all the tech and tools that uh, my usual process does. Mm -hmm. So I also had to um, dilute that down and try to explain it to a three-year-old, which was challenging. <laughs> <laughs> well, I love the approach in it. I, I couldn't help but uh, think that it, it resonates with uh, the vision I have for this podcast, which is the simple joy of creating. It taps into your passion and going back to the roots of the art form. And um, so I think it's, it's neat. There's something uh, deeply satisfying about playing an instrument and knowing how it was made. Um, so again, the, the end result um, is stellar. Thank you. Yeah, it, it was a good, kind of a good touchstone, you know, at like five or six years deep in my career of that. I, I kind of like, from my head, the three-hammer challenge for me was also like, could I make instruments after the apocalypse, <laughs> right? Like, if, every, if, all, if everything here goes away, could I still make it with just three hammers? And it's like, yeah, yeah, yeah it, could, it, could, it could carry on. So that was kind of the silly way to think about it. Like, oh, if, if I lost all of my tools and everything, like I could still just take some metal and make something that makes noise. Mm -hmm. And now that really goes back to that original inspiration of just finding a barrel and just making something. So yeah. um, I, was, I was very satisfied with the project from that aspect too. What is next for Colin Folk? What do you have in store for the future? That's, that's a great question. You know, my, I, I feel in the five or six years, I have generated a, a really high level of inertia in that my momentum continues to go. So um, I'm still kind of riding that wave. So there's things I'm always kind of working on, um, kind of left-hand turns I'm exploring to see if I want to take something that way. Um, there's a few things. My, I'm, I am building my second hydroforming machine right now, mm -hmm. which has been informed by those 50 other machines that have been built around the world. People took it and absolutely made it better. Yeah. And, and the success of open sourcing is that if you do make an improvement, you, you feed it back into the system. And so that has happened in a really big way. Mm -hmm. I've been able to kind of, as these improvements have come, Frankenstein my original machine as much mm -hmm. as possible, but it has some limitations just due to original designs. So um, I'm really in the process of completing that right now, which is I'm, I've been really wanting to make machine 2.0 and now I've been able to do it or I'm doing it. Um, what else looking around the shop? Um, yeah, there, I mean, there's a few other projects. There's, we, we touched on it before. So sitting behind me is my cello which has not has never been here in the shop. It only came here a few weeks ago. Um, I think this is worth touching on in, in terms of what this podcast um, really kind of delves into. I have been trying to redefine my relationship with that instrument, mm. which, which for me has been a really touchy subject in my relationship with that instrument previously was defined for me. Um, 
And I made that reference to my calling my mom and saying, I'm still using those cello lessons. I, I still think in cello. That's still my primary thought process in terms of music and composing. Um, cellos are tuned in fifths, so I have, like, I still reference when someone's like, oh, what's the fifth of an F sharp? I, like, mentally put my finger on an F sharp on a D string and just jump to the other string to be like, oh, it's a C sharp. Like, that's still my reference point. And I was, someone asked, they're like, why don't you play it? And I said, for me, playing that instrument is like spending time with an ex, like a, an ex-romantic relationship. And they kind of laughed, and I said, no, like, I, I spent 15 years playing that instrument on a really intimate level, mm -hmm. um, and it didn't end well. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it was a bad breakup. And, and they kind of still laughed, and I said, no, I said, I think you're really underplaying, like, what a, a relationship with an instrument can be. Mm -hmm. You're viewing it as someone who doesn't, play an instrument so you're having a hard time understanding how intimate it can be and, and so I had talked through what it would even be like for me to to get that out of the case and play it like just moving the case around it's physical opening the case there's a smell in the case mm -hmm. and to talk about like sensory activation just the smell of that case brings back a lot of not so great memories but mm -hmm. I was fo I've been focusing on what the end of that relationship was mm -hmm. and really my work to do is remember that there are actually you know this wonderful time in that relationship then it just mm -hmm. ended sour so I've been kind of re-examining that and part of it too is and we may view this later is I have essentially like uh, how you jailbreak an iPhone I have I've jailbreaked my cello um, it is not a standard cello anymore I have turned it into something that m makes me feel inspired to have a new relationship with it yeah. part of it has just been simple things like I got um, new tuning pegs that are planetary gears which is just a new upgrade um, I have changed the strings around so it's not a, a cellist a standard cellist wouldn't sit down and be able to play sheet music on that thing anymore mm. which that was the goal of like I don't want to be able to even physically play sheet music with this instrument anymore because right. I don't want that to be my relationship with it anymore so the goal being that I want to get it back into that fun zone I want to have a relationship with it where I want to pick it up and play it yeah. and so part of that has been and so this person that I was having this, this discussion with finally said, well, you know it's not a person, right? It's like an object. You, it's a one-sided relationship. It's mm -hmm. not a two-person relationship. You have a relationship with this instrument. So you are fully in control of what that relationship is. And so it was the challenge that came from that person that allowed me to really kind of re-examine it. Um, something else that happened was my three-year-old daughter went to a symphony and a kid symphony where she got to walk through the aisles and interact with people playing instruments and one of the instruments that was on display was a cello and she had the realization of like oh we have those one we mm. have one of those at our house but she'd never seen it she'd never seen me play it so she came home with this curiosity about this thing in our house that she'd never seen mm. and she asked if I could play it for her and that was such a beautiful start to this new relationship that it was oh I'm you're just curious about this thing and I am someone who can share this with you and yeah. so just to be able to sit and let her explore it and play some stuff for her really helped spark that and then it has just gone like way off the rails in terms of um, yeah changing the string setup and adding an extra string and I've added sympathetic strings mm -hmm. so there's a bunch going on with it um, and to, what you're talking about here is to take full ownership of your passion and what you're really talking about is culture yeah right it's it's the culture around an instrument around an art form it's quite fascinating to think that we're at the beginning of, of such a new art form and that we can impact the trajectory that that, that this will take yeah um, absolutely man it's been a a fascinating conversation. Um, so folks can find out all there is to know about the ether, your instrument, at cfolk.com. Yep. Um, I'm assuming they can sign up on your wait list if they want to acquire an instrument. Yeah, you can. Just, so what we do is we have you just sign up for updates there, and then you can receive emails about how to do that and opportunities. I also tell people to sign up because I am crazy enough that I just give them away on occasion where it's just there's an instrument that I'm going to give away. You take your name, put it in the hat. I draw a name. That person gets the instrument. So there is one that is live in the recording of this, mm -hmm. which is the Three Hammer Challenge instrument is a giveaway. <gasps> oh, you didn't know that. I did not oh, know that. Oh, so you know what that means, oh, everybody, is it means that he didn't watch the entire video. Because at the very end of the video, there's a 10-second clip that says, like, congratulations, you watched the entire thing. Sign up here to win this instrument. 
Wow. Yeah. So that one is a giveaway, and it's going to go till about the end of the month. So. Uh, wow. Yeah. Well, there's a very lucky person out there who's going to get a one of a kind. One of a kind. Ether. Yeah, and my realization with the three hammer challenge is I should probably do it every year. That was my takeaway of like I'm. I probably have to do this every year in that it's going to be an important checkpoint every year to just go back to the basics. I'm going to yeah. fear it <laughs> every year. I'm going to know it's coming, but it's, I really think it's, it's something that I'm going to have to do every year. And you're, you're really good at documenting all of these. So uh, for anyone listening, go to seafolk.com. Um, your Instagram uh, account is where the So You Want to Make Henpans series yep. is at. Um, a lot of stuff on your YouTube channel as well. Colin, thanks so much for a great time sitting down and, and revisiting all there is uh, to your journey with the art form. Yeah, thank you for coming and thank you for having me. All right, this wraps up this two-parter series with Colin Folk. As a reminder, you will find show notes for this episode and every other episode at thehenpenpodcast.com. Feel free to join the Henpen Podcast community. It's a Facebook group for those of us who pursue the simple joy of creating. It's a place where you can share your video and audio recordings, your thoughts and photos about your own creative journey. There's no competition, no ego trip. It's just a way for us to connect and bounce ideas about the many themes we touch on through the podcast. You can also pick up merch at thehenpenpodcast.com. There are three amazing designs made by my friend Jeff Kane, who's a brilliant graphic designer and illustrator. The most popular one is a wacky illustration of a green alien playing the handpan. It's available on t-shirts, hoodies, tote bags, stickers, and even shower curtains. Thanks everyone who already ordered one. Your purchase helps support this ad-free podcast. If you want to check out the merch, Simply go to thehenpenpodcast.com and click merch. That's it for this episode of the Henpen Podcast. Thank you for listening and talk to you in the next one.